great pleasure to introduce on behalf of the people and NFO in the state of Wisconsin, Governor Pat Lucy. Thank you very much, Orrin Lee. I'm just delighted to have this opportunity to come here today to see so many of my old friends and to welcome the NFO back to Milwaukee and to Wisconsin for a national convention. I'm glad that you had a chance to hear from our great mayor of Milwaukee, Henry Meyer, too often there's a feeling in this country that there is nothing in common between the people who live in the central cities of our nation and the people who live in rural America. He mentioned the Have Not Conference and he was a little modest about it because it was really his brainchild and it did more to bring about tax reform in this state than any other one initiative simply because it pointed out the commonality of interest between low-income people in central cities and in rural Wisconsin and how they were being discriminated against in our tax system. And we corrected that. Orrin Lee Staley and I have been political colleagues for a long, long time. I don't know that I have made this uh, public disclosure before, but uh, in 1968, he and I worked hand in glove in at least three states during the primary season on behalf of the late Senator Robert Kennedy in Nebraska, in Oregon, and in California. And if some of you who are nonpartisan or, heaven forbid, Republicans uh, might resent that, uh, I checked it out and the statute of limitations has run, so there's nothing you can do to punish Orrin Lee for his involvement. Uh, but I learned in one day the political effectiveness of the NFO when I saw your national president, together with the president of the Nebraska NFO, sitting in a hot hotel room, not even leaving for lunch, we sent a sandwich in, calling the key members of the NFO in Nebraska to alert them of the importance of the primary the next day. We had Kennedy majorities in counties of 1,500 or 2,500 people where the only contact, other than the remote possibility that in some of those distant areas they happened to watch Omaha television, which was unlikely, the only real contact we had was a telephone call from your national president or from the state president of the NFO. And those votes turned out. And I think that was a forerunner of what happened on November 2nd of 1976 in Wisconsin and throughout this country. Steve Pavich and the Wisconsin NFO have been in the forefront of the fight to provide both stability and vitality to Wisconsin Family Farms. And I must say that Wisconsin Family Farms are the keystone to this state's economy. I should also I would also like to thank your leadership this morning for permitting me to come on here and speak out of order uh, in the early uh, morning session rather than when I was originally scheduled to speak this afternoon. And I think you ought to know why I asked for this change in your program. This afternoon I am to go to Washington together with two other governors to meet at Blair House with President-elect Carter and President-elect Mondale. The alleged, or at least the, the principal topic of discussion, will be federal-state relations. But I want you to know that I hope this will be an occasion when I can tell Jimmy Carter in detail of the extraordinary effort made by the NFO in this past election in Wisconsin. This fall, the NFO showed 
that it has become a truly effective political force in this nation and in particularly in Wisconsin. Look at this year's Democratic Party platform. It says, and I quote, and I'm sure the words will sound familiar, we must assure parity returns to farmers based on the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. This has been your platform, the NFO's platform, for many years. And now it is the Democratic Party's pledge to you. And these words were included in the Democratic Party platform at the urging of Steve Pavich and other NFO leaders. And after that platform was adopted, let's just for a moment take a look at what happened in terms of the election campaign here in Wisconsin. Wisconsin farmers finally had a clear choice. Jimmy Carter had pledged to support the establishment of 85 percent parity for dairy products. And President Ford had vetoed 85 percent parity for dairy products. If the 85 percent parity bill had been signed instead of being vetoed, October milk prices would have been more than 50 cents per hundredweight higher than they actually were. And the NFO reminded the farmers of this state that had that bill been signed, instead of it being vetoed, it would have made a very substantial difference in their milk checks to the extent that farmers lost on a daily basis, because of that veto, $250,000 each and every day. The Wisconsin farmers heard that NFO message, and they remembered their shrinking milk checks when they went to the polls on November 2nd, and they voted for Jimmy Carter. 21 agricultural counties from northeastern, northwestern Wisconsin Counties that very often would vote for the other party, particularly in presidential campaigns, gave President-elect Jimmy Carter 31,000 of his 34,000 vote margin in Wisconsin. Now, some of you from other states may think that this was a landslide here in Wisconsin because CBS projected a Wisconsin win very early in the game on election night. How they managed to project it so early, I don't know. But the total vote was only 2 million and 40,000. And both candidates got over 2 million. And Jimmy Carter won by about 34,000 votes. And 31,000 of those votes came out of just those 20 rural counties in northwestern Wisconsin where we know of the political effectiveness of the NFO leadership. Without your help, not only in Wisconsin but throughout the country, the results of this very close election could have been very different indeed. On January 20th, we will have a new Democratic administration in Washington and a new Democratic administration with a unique opportunity before it. An opportunity to fulfill the promise of our party's platform, an opportunity to provide the nation's farmers with cost to production plus a reasonable profit. An opportunity to raise support levels to at least 85 percent of parity and to revitalize the dairy industry in this state and in this nation. And I am appalled at the fact that over the last four or five years, in this great state, America's Dairyland, we have been losing dairy farmers at the rate of more than a thousand farms per year going out of the dairy industry. It will be an opportunity to develop export policies that are aggressive but at the same time provide for market stability. It will be an opportunity to impose the same rigorous standards on imported dairy products that apply to our own domestic production of dairy products. It will provide an opportunity to allow, through credit and tax policy, a chance for the young farmer to continue his family's tradition of working the soil. In short, 
With a Jimmy Carter administration, we are faced with a chance and a unique opportunity to revitalize American agriculture and the family farm. And it is thanks to you, to your hard work and to your votes, that we have that chance. And knowing your leadership as I do, I am sure that they will not hesitate to remind this administration of your hard work and your votes that gave them this chance to perform. And I would hope that you won't let us Democrats forget the commitments we made and the political performance of your organization. Because only in that way will the best interests of the rank and file membership of this organization be best served. I welcome you to America's Dairyland, and I wish you success and good luck in your work and in your deliberations here in Wisconsin. Thank you very much. for all that you people do in furthering what we think is a most serious cause uh, in the United States, but also throughout the world. So that gratitude uh, is most sincere, and I think it's important that you know that, and that the cause that you're working on extends far beyond your own fence lines, your own county, states, and even beyond this country. I would tell a story, but I'm afraid that I've shared them with all of you by this time. It's a little bit like the guy who stopped in to get a hamburger late at night, the fellow who owned the hamburger shop was just closing up and uh, was rather annoyed, but the truck driver ordered two hamburgers and he was just about done with them when he ordered two more. He almost had them finished when he ordered two more. And finally, he ordered the seventh and eighth one, and the guy who was making the hamburger said, Mr., he said, if you would have told me that you wanted eight hamburgers when you come in here, he said, I would have made you eight hamburgers. But he said, right now, I'm completely out of meat. <laughs> so I think we'll let that suffice for the stories. I would share with you a couple of experiences that we've had in the last week to indicate a little bit the importance of the work that you're about here and as you've been told so often the importance of the work at home. I had occasion to visit with the head of a farm organization from the Netherlands about a week ago. And we were telling him that farmers in America were producing products below the cost of production. And his response to us, in some amazement, was, can't the farmers organize and demand what is their right? And I had to say that to this point, it would appear no. Not that there weren't groups that wanted to, but that that job was left to be at least 100% accomplished. The other took place just a day or so ago in meeting with some foundation people from some of the big multinational corporations, people who have a stake in rural America and a very heavy stake in your pocket. And they, the subject of food being power came up and one of the representatives from one of the big corporations that incidentally buy your products said, if food is power, and yet the producers in this country don't have that power. He didn't say they couldn't have. He just said they don't. I would just ask you to 
think about that and to realize that I think there are a lot of people, not only in the United States, a lot of people who buy food and fiber from people like yourselves, that are utterly amazed that the kind of objectives that NFO have have not been achieved. They can't hardly believe it. And taking that same experience, we found it to be true even in Europe. The importance of your work seems to me to go back to the bicentennial that we are in the process and about to complete the celebration of. And that one of the great objectives of the United States 200 years ago was justice and liberty for all. And we could spend a lot of time saying what that means. But I would remind you that just one of the factors that was so important 200 years ago and is just as important today, an almost absolute basis and foundation upon which that ability to seek and to find justice and liberty for all was based on the land being in the hands of many people and those who live on the land and own the land to produce the food and fiber from that land. That was a basis and a foundation upon which the founding fathers of this country insisted, and I think we must insist on it yet today. And yet, you and I both know that in the last 200 years, something has gone awry with that. Part of it has been the fault of farmers, and part of it has been the fault of society. It's been the fault of farmers because they refused to do what was necessary to accomplish or to continue that goal that was set down, who refused to work together. It was the fault of society who somehow or other thinks that if they can steal the gifts that God gives to society through the efforts of farmers and others, that somehow or other that's good for that society. We all know that it's not. We know that time, and we've been saying this, I know, the time is running out. It has run out for a lot of folks, as you well know, a lot of your neighbors, a lot of the people in rural communities. And you'll hear another thing. You'll hear now people talking about the great turnaround. Somebody found a handful of statistics that indicated that people were leaving the inner cities, the large metropolitan areas, and moving back to the country. Well, I haven't seen any great evidence of that in many of the places where people like you and I come from. And I haven't seen any great rush back to the farm, not because there aren't people who would like to be there, but because they realize that at the present time, it's difficult, if not impossible. Time will run out on us as a society if we're not successful, if we cannot learn how to work together Organizations such as NFO, organizations, church organizations, and others that Chuck mentioned that he worked with, that we're very grateful to him for that kind of cooperation. Then it will run out for all of our society. It may not run out in our lifetime, and that's the tragedy. The people like you and I who live today may not live to see the results of our lack of foresight, of our unwillingness to sacrifice, our inability to cooperate. But people like this little child here in the front row may well live to know about it. How much time do we have left? I think it's a little bit like the two old Irishmen who come to this country, and there was a cannon that faced out over the ocean and they delighted in shooting it off from time to time. And finally, they got in trouble with the authorities, and they told them that if they were to do that once more, they would deport them. So they liked it so much that they decided that if they would hold the tub over the end of the cannon, they could muffle the noise and continue to shoot it off. And so Pat said he would take care of the tub, and Mike should shoot the cannon off. And Pat took the tub, and he held it very securely over the end of the cannon, and Mike went back and fired it. And there was, of course, a great noise and an ex explosion. 
and the cops come running up and they said, what's going on? And Mike says, well, he said, you know, he said, Pat just went out for a tub of water. And he said, if he comes back as fast as he went out, he should have been here sometime yesterday. <laughs> That's how much time we have left. Again, Orrin Lee, thank you very much, and thank you for having <laughs> Doctor, we're glad to have you with us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I consider it a great privilege and honor and an opportunity to speak at the National Farmers Organization National Convention. There are many things that are of importance to us today that are occurring at the national, international level, concerns and opportunities with respect to agriculture. Mr. Chairman, I'm waiting for the lights to be dimmed, and I hope that our man up there uh, will uh, cut the lights down. I'd like the lights down. What we will be doing is showing you visual presentations of what we think are some important issues in terms of national and international agriculture. The folks on the stand can turn around and see the screen and uh, our focus of attention will be on the screen and pointing out that the, uh, and the, as many lights as we can get out will be most helpful here this morning if we can do that. Can we cut the money lower? We have gone through uh, 10 centuries of population, uh, population growth and the events that we are now engaged in relate to the agricultural revolution. And we're just in the threshold of what is designated as the agricultural revolution. This is the population curve uh, of the world. I think we should remember that each year the requirement on a worldwide basis is 25 million additional tons of uh, metric tons of feed grains just alone to meet this rising population. Now, a year ago, we held an international conference on crop productivity. It happened to be in northern Michigan. And here again, we have a curve of the rising trend of the population on the earth. Never before have we had so many people. Never before have they been multiplying so rapidly. And never before was the challenge greater as far as agriculture is concerned. It's depicted by the words of a very famous uh, nutritionist, John Mayer, that in the next 25 years, It'll be necessary for us to produce as much food as has been produced by, for mankind up until all history until now. One could look at an effort that we were engaged in at the National Research Council, World Food and Nutrition Study. It's still going on. The final report will be released June 30th, 1977. This is the first edition, the enhancement of food production for the United States. There are a number of reasons why we need to be concerned about increasing food production in the United States. They're given there, and you're all familiar with them, humanitarian, reduce anxiety and restlessness everywhere. Keep food prices reasonable and prices, that means for producers as well as consumers, for everyone, maintain a balance of payments in foreign trade. Here's an ethic that I do not subscribe to, the so-called lifeboat ethic, or the triage concept that we're going to have to decide soon as to which people are expendable on this earth and let them go and starve. I don't subscribe to that. It's morally unacceptable. It's politically unrealistically unrealistic. It is uh, economically unsound, ladies and gentlemen. And from the standpoint of uh, uh, the management of resources and uh, any, uh, uh, any attention given to the creativity of the human mind, entirely not necessary. Now, folks, agriculture is nothing more than farming the sun. It's the only major industry in the world that processes solar energy for the use of mankind. And as we could look at a typical, typical landscape, an agricultural landscape across this nation, you can see the rising sun, and you can see a cornfield in the foreground, a livestock operation. And what we do in agriculture, as you well know, is to design management practices to capture as much energy as possible from the sun and to make it available for mankind. Now, crops differ a great deal, ladies and gentlemen, in terms of their ability to capture energy from the sun, ranging all the way from sugarcane and corn and, so and sorghum, which are very efficient in capturing solar energy, to those down here, the fruits and the vegetables and some of the small grains, which have much less efficiency. In fact, you can divide agricultural crops into two groups, 
those that are very efficient in capturing energy from the sun, and those which are less efficient. These plants will respire when they're exposed to sun. They will breathe twice as rapidly and burn up half of what they produce. Now, there's a great challenge in terms of opportunities and targets of opportunities for research in the future. It all goes back to the green leaf. This is the solar energy processing system that exists on this earth, and this is something that politicians and many other people don't appreciate yet in this day and age. And then you look at these major crops which have tremendous capability of capturing energy from the sun. We look at sugarcane as it's grown in Hawaii. We could look at uh, corn in the corn belt in a nation that produces as much corn or maize as all the rest of the world combined. This is a crop which will produce more total digestible nutrients per unit time than any other crop we can produce in most parts of the United States. That's why we grow so much of it. It goes back to history. Here's a man who lived 100 years ago, William J. Beale. He was a scientist. He put together a package of those that were in the basic research area, those in the applied area, and Beale and his students eventually resulted in the production of commercial hybrid corn, the most significant scientific achievement the world has ever known. And it happened right here almost in our own back door. And there is what we see. It's still going on. We haven't received or achieved the ultimate in terms of hybrid corn varieties. We're still producing them, still creating them. We could look at the pattern of productivity in bushels per acre of corn yields in this nation going back to 1930, carrying through to 1975-76. We can see the introduction of hybrids in the early 1930s, and then the line that goes up where they've increased the production of that crop by threefold in a matter of 40 years. We notice also a leveling off, however, at this point, and that causes us some concern. We could go on and look at corn, this export, this high technology export in this nation. Look into Western Europe. You could have gone there 15 years ago in Western Europe, and you didn't see corn fields. But you go there today in Germany and in France and England and even in Scandinavia, and you can see hundreds of thousands of acres of corn where corn was not there before. Corn production in Germany has increased 3,000 percent in the last 15 years. And there is one of the most dramatic agricultural transitions the world has known in Western Europe as a result of the introduction of hybrid corn. We can see it here. Even in the Punjab of India, our technology has been exported abroad and corn is being produced in India as it has never been produced before. We can look at sorghum. Sorghum very closely related to corn and also very high in photosynthetic ability. It does capture a lot of energy from the sun and that's why we grow so much of it, almost a billion bushels this past year. Hybrids were introduced in 1955, only 26 years ago, or only 21 years ago, excuse me, and note what happened following the introduction of hybrid sorghum. The precipitous rise in productivity, but also notice the leveling off that is occurring in just the last few years, 1970s. And there again, we see a concern in terms of major crop, and we have concerns with respect to many things. There are biological systems that interfere with crop productivity, and blackbirds are one of them, as we see here in a sorghum field as it approaches maturity. And blackbird, our bird-resistant grain sorghum, is one of the challenges we face in terms of research. We could go to a crop that we don't grow very much of in the United States. It's pearl millet. But on a worldwide basis, there's a lot of it produced. And one can see pearl millet as one of the major crops that's resistant to hot, dry conditions because it is more resistant to hot, dry conditions than even sorghum, and much more so than corn. Then we can look at the most determinate factor in crop productivity, and most of our people don't appreciate this, folks, that the most responsible factor for crop productivity is the weather. That was the drought is where it hit in 1974, the Corn Belt. And as a result of that, the production of soybeans and corn in this nation were reduced by 20 percent because it didn't rain at the right time and didn't rain enough. You could go into a field in an early planting of corn in southern Michigan, as I did in the September of 1974, and see almost a crop failure. And just a block away, you could see a planting of corn that was planted later, and then you see a very good crop. It's not only the amount of rainfall, it's when the rain comes. It's the distribution of the rainfall. It's when we reach those critical stages in crop production when you have to have rain. Well, we've had a little problem this year in terms of drought. A drought out in the Great Plains, the Dakotas up there in Minnesota. We've got one in California still persisting out there. It hasn't alleviated itself yet. And, of course, this has had tremendous impact in terms of wheat production this year, even though we have this year the second the most, the highest production we've ever had in this, in this nation. One could look at world drought areas for 1976. Uh, yes, a drought in Western Europe. There was a drought here in the Dakotas and Minnesota. There was a drought in California, Australia. Good crops in some other parts of the, of, of the world.
Those things are of mighty concern to us in terms of agriculture for the future. The second most important world food, food crop on earth is what we're seeing here. And as we look at wheat, we can look at what is por called a port, what is sometimes referred to as the Green Revolution. Norman Borlaug, the Nobel Peace Laureate of 1970, the Peace Prize winner, and what he did in terms of shortening up the wheat plant, the triple dwarfs, the double, the single, and those which are not dwarf at all. These varieties of wheat which will out yield those types we have been growing previously. And they've had a worldwide significance. There's in the, Pund or I should say, the Indian Agricultural Research Institute in New Delhi, the short-statured wheat varieties that are high yielding, that will not lodge, and then the tall ones which will lop over. And then one could look and realize that any wheat variety we introduce or any major crop variety we introduce has a lifetime of only about five years. There's a constant battle between man and pests that invade and destroy crops. That happens to be the rust wheat, the stripe rust on wheat, the resistant variety here. There's a constant conflict of what we'd like to do in terms of what, uh, uh, what other biological systems come into play. And we look at the wheat fields of the great Palouse area. From Steptoe Butte in eastern Washington, southwest west of Spokane, Washington, this fabulous area in terms of, and this of course is a creation of man in terms of varieties of wheat which are high yielding, some of the highest on earth. One can look at the most important uh, food crop on earth, rice, and go to the Far East for just a moment, in the, one of the little valleys of South Korea, and there see what we call the rice paddies in the lowlands, in the corn fields, in the little Korean hut, in the uh, soybean fields on the mountainside. Land is an important resource in many parts of the world and every bit of it is utilized. One could look at the Indian Agricultural Research Institute and look at the problem of rice, where it lops over, falls flat on its face just before maturity, greatly reduces yield, and then we could introduce. And so one could go about in Far East Asia and see the short-statured varieties and see the local scientists who work, the tall ones in the back. One could look at a close-up of the rice panicle, the most important food crop on earth, and see the flag leaves below and then how scientists have changed the position of those flag leaves to extend them above the panicle of grain so that they'll be more exposed to sunlight and capture the energy from the sun. There are many, many challenges and many opportunities in the field of, the, of, of research when it comes to food production. One could look at an entire field of rice and see why those flag leaves now are extending above the panicles of grain when they're exposed to sunlight and are much more efficient in capturing and processing that solar energy. One could look at a new crop, a creation of man, triticale it's called, a cross between wheat and rye. And notice the difference, the two parents, the doubling up and the triticales. Now the re re reason for the interest in triticales is because it, is, it can be more productive, it can be higher in nutritive value, and it can be more adaptive than either of the parents. And triticale is becoming a reality now in this nation and that some companies are processing it and making bread from triticale. One could look at triticale for just a moment right here. Notice the protein level. Notice the high lysine level. It is superior in terms of nutritive value. One could look at also the great range which exists in the protein levels of the cereal grains and also the ranges in lysine and the realization that this is the limiting amino acid in terms of the protein values of cereal grains. And then one could go about the world and look at what's being done in terms of increasing the protein and lysine levels of cereal grains, the People's Republic of China in terms of rice, or the maize crop of the United States increasing the protein levels there because it's not only to increase, important to increase food production, it's also important to increase the nutritive value of what we produce. And then one could look at the kinds of maize or corn that is acceptable for other parts of the world in Latin America, for example. The corn, as we take a close-up of it, is not the kind of corn that we produce in the United States, but when corn is to be used by people, it has to have a certain color, shape, and size, and appearance, and texture. And whereas in this nation, we consume only 15% for human consumption directly of the maize or corn that we produce in some nations in Latin America, corn is the number one food crop for people. One could look at sorghum for just a moment, look at Dr. Axtell and his student at Purdue University see the development of the high lysine, the high protein grain sorghum. One could look at legumes because legumes play an important role in terms of feeding people the peas and the beans and the lentils and the pulses. This is the grain market in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. And then one could look at Brazil for just a moment. 
this rising competitor in terms of soybeans and the field beans, of which there's two million tons of these beans produced every year in Brazil. And in Brazil, each family consumes 15 kilograms of these beans each month. They're scarcely above the primitive lines. The great amount could be done to develop them. And of course, the, here is a competitor that's rising very rapidly with respect to our own crops. We could look at the mung bean in terms of people abroad and the mung bean root, and on the roots we see little nodules, little bumps, and those nodules contain bacteria, and those bacteria can appropriate atmospheric nitrogen and incorporate it in means of fertilizing the crop itself, and so we see a great challenge in the legumes. Here's another one, the, the so-called pigeon pea, not used for food in this country, but 82% of the pigeon peas of the world are consumed in India. Or one could look at the wing bean of Africa, a new kind of crop having great potential and one we need to be concerned about that's growing abroad. We can look at peanuts, and everybody today, of course, is in peanuts. One can notice that and see not only the, pot, the little uh, uh, the little uh, the peanuts themselves, but also the nodules, and the nodules contain bacteria, and the bacteria have the ability of fixing atmospheric nitrogen and making it available for crop production. And one can look at the Cinderella crop of America, the soybean, the soybean of the United States, where this crop alone provides 20% of the edible oil in the world and 50% of all the oil seed meal that's produced in the world, and we produce more soybeans than all the rest of the world combined. We look at inputs into agriculture, look at fertilizer, and the price of fertilizer, how it dropped down to a low level in 1970, how it rose precipitously. It's going down a little bit more now, but nitrogen fertilizer is going to continue to be expensive. We can look at the sources of nitrogen fertilizer in crop production, 40 million metric tons coming from commercial fertilizer and chemical fixation, 200 million metric tons coming from biological nitrogen fixation. What I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen, is that there's a tremendous potential in enhancing biological nitrogen fixation for crop production and alleviating the need for the purchase of the massive amounts of chemical fertilizer that require large fossil fuel inputs. We can look what's happening in terms of scientists who can go into the field now and measure the magnitude of biological nitrogen fixation in the field using new technologies, and then one can look at the great challenge in terms of agriculture, one of them. Only 25 to 50 percent of nitrogen we apply in crop production is recovered by the crop, only 20 percent of the phosphorus, only 35 percent of the potassium. We need to more efficiently utilize this valuable resource. We can look at the effects of inoculation on soybeans in India compared to the non-inoculated with the right kind of organisms. We don't get those dramatic differences here, but they do in some parts of the world. We can look at the rice paddies of the Far East and see the blue-green algae that add to this nitrogen source by biological means. One could look at endomycorrhiza, these new fungal extensions on roots which enable the roots to capture more of the nutrients in the soil. There are many, many frontiers in terms of plant nutrition. One could go to the People's Republic of China and see a pigsty in the foreground and then see why they're using soil improving crops and starting a young orchard. Or one could go to India and see the combination of intercropping of a legume with a grain crop. Now folks, we need to think more about that in this country, of combining our, our cereal grains with legumes for soil enrichment purposes. One could go to South America and see the cassava interplanted with beans. And the idea of intercropping and multiple cropping is emerging in many parts of the world. Here's the third crop that this man has grown in the Philippines on the island of Iloilo. Two crops of rice and then the third crop of mung beans or soybeans or cowpeas. One can look at sunflowers. New folks are interested in sunflowers. Hybrid sunflowers in this nation now constitute 80% of the total production. We have a million acres of them, a tremendous opportunity. It's an oil crop. It can be competitive. We can look at the African oil palm, and here we've got problems. African oil palms can be grown all the way from the Tropic of Cancer to the Tropic of Capricorn. And here we see it, and here's where the oil comes from. There's the fruit that it produces, that it produces, and African oil palm is, has increasingly come into this country so that this past year over 10% of the edible oils came from this source, and there's where it all comes from, that fruit right there. And it's extremely competitive with soybeans. We've got international problems to deal with in terms of imports, in terms of exports. There's the potato, the sweet potato in, intercropped with sugarcane in, in, in China. We can look at the cassava, this great energy crop of which they can produce as much as 50 tons of this per hectare per year. Fantastic crop in the tropics. One can look at high-intensity agriculture and go to Japan for just a moment. One can see the ever-present compost pile in the foreground and realize 
something that in terms of fruits and vegetables in this nation and throughout the world, they make a tremendous contribution in terms of feeding people. And yet they don't get into world food statistics. There are seven markets like this in, in Tokyo alone. This is the Tanda market, showing every variety of fruit and vegetable on sale. Products that are produced locally and consumed locally. And the marketing system is local. Here we can see the floating market in Bangkok, in Thailand. Or one can see the market, the open air market in Turku, in Finland, in August. Or one can see in Bombay, in India. These city markets, these people's markets, where tremendous produce is produced and circulates very rapidly. Or Santo Domingo, in Ecuador, one can see the local fruit and vegetable markets that are important for feeding people. And then we look at home storage and what is done in small operations, these family farms throughout the world, and look at the home storage that has been created for storing potatoes in the Andes of South America. Then one can look at horticultural crops for just a moment and see the transition that's taking place in these varieties of apples, known as the spur type of fruiting, in which apples literally rope out on the branches. Or look at hybrid carrots, a creation of the 1970s, a uniform in shape, size, and color, and yielding twice as much. Or onions of this bronze color which will not sprout in storage. These and many other things are emerging in terms of this agricultural revolution. You can even now blend or you can fuse vegetative cells of plants and create new individuals. Not going the usual sexual route. Here is the idea of test tube genetics, of starting plants, fusing vegetative cells and providing the right cultural media to bring about complete differentiation of new individuals. You can even take pollen grains and you can culture them in test tubes. And here is a garden in a test tube and they're half the chromosome number. New possibilities in terms of creating new types of plants. Now, on an international basis and on a national basis, land use is a, is a, is a, is a horrible issue. Here we see the urban sprawl, realizing that in this nation, we are taking out of production one and a quarter million acres of land every year, irreversible, irreversible land use. And someday, somewhere, we're going to have to be more concerned than we have been at the political level in preserving prime agricultural land for agricultural food production. It's not only a problem in the United States, worldwide. Here we see erosion. Soil erosion is one of the great issues and problems in this nation. We lose each year 3.6 billion tons of topsoil from our lands. And of course, soil conservation practices are extremely important in preserving this resource, which is now being put into irreversible uses. Then one can look, go back for just a moment into ancient America. You know, we could learn things, I think, even from the Incas of South America as we can see those terraces up on the mountainside and then drop down for just a moment and view the grandeur of Machu Picchu, that ancient civilization, see the terraces of how they were concerned about the conservation of soil, the conservation of water. And then one of the emerging technologies that we have today is the no-till or the zero tillage system, where you go in, use a weed killer, destroy the sod, and then seed the crop directly in the sod without plow plow plowing the soil and carrying that crop right on through to maturity without tillage, no cultivation, no harrowing, no disking. And then notice finally at the end, conservation of soil, conservation of organic matter, conservation of water, and conservation of energy, an emerging technology of worldwide significance. You can even go to Britain and you can see what they're doing there. Tens of thousands of acres now being sprayed, the stubble of a previous small grain crop, killing the weeds, and then going in and seeding the crop without plowing the land, seeding in the stubble of the previous crop. One could go out in the Great Plains here in the United States, 10 million acres now irrigated by these pivot systems, very highly in energy, uh, uh, high energy re uh, resource intensive. 10 times more energy is utilized in uh, irrigating by this system than all the other energy inputs that go into corn production. We can see where fertilizer is being added at the same time, very useful and wise purpose. We can look at alternative methods of water management for just a moment. Drip or trickle irrigation, it's called. It was introduced about 10 years ago in Israel. This is the Dead Sea. This is En Gedi along the borders of the Dead Sea where David hid out as a refugee from King Saul in the days of biblical times. One could look at trickle irrigation or drip irrigation in the Great Columbia Basin and see a young orchard being started. This is the conventional system of irrigating everything. Now if you string these drip or trickle irrigation lines only along where the trees are and use that system of, of water management, you utilize or use only one-tenth the amount of water that's otherwise required. There are new and emerging systems of water use. One could go to Southern California, San Diego County, California. See the great strawberry fields. They're under plastic. It's a very capital intensive, uh, resource intensive, and management intensive kind of agriculture, but it's drip irrigation all the way through. 
conservation of a valuable resource in Southern California, while drip or trickle irrigation is putting water where the plants are, it's irrigating the plants or the crop instead of irrigating the soil. We look at the use of energy in, agri in, in the USA, and we hear a lot about energy inputs into agriculture. You know, the total food system only requires 15 percent to put everything together in the food system. This is where energy goes. In the United States, if you take that food system and take it apart, then we see in foreign production only 17 percent of the total of that go of the food system goes into food production. The rest is in processing, marketing, and manufacturing. In fact, less than 3 percent of the energy in this nation goes into agricultural production because agriculture is the only major industry that processes solar energy. And when we produce corn, 90 percent of the energy that goes into the production of corn comes from the sun, and only 10 percent comes from oil. And that's a message that needs to get through at high levels in policy decision-making in this nation. In terms of the importance of agriculture and the energy input and the energy output, we look at, look at, look at livestock production for just a moment in the nation, extremely important component. Look at dairying industry or cattle. Utilize about two-thirds of the feed, feed units come from forages and not from grain. We could look at beef cattle, look at genetic improvement through crossbreeding. Gunnison, Colorado, see the mountains in the background. We could look at uh, sheep. And these animals in time, in, obtain all their nutrients from grazing off the land. They harvest their own, their own food by grazing, as we know it here. We could look at this great resource that we have that extends all the way from the Mexican to the Canadian border, 300 million acres of it, the prairie lands of the United States. This is where the beef cattle come from. And then, by contrast, we could go to India for just a moment, the National Dairy Research Institute at Cornell in India, and there see a program where they are, have improved types of dairy animals entirely on forages, a combination of genetic improvement and improvement of forages to produce milk in one of the most destitute countries on earth. And then we look at the ever-present silo. There's much that we can learn about what goes into the silo. There, as we see in the foreground, the corn field. And then we can note new technologies in which we can harvest corn at uh, uh, 66 percent moisture and then incorporate at the same time non-protein nitrogen in the form of anhydrous ammonia solutions or anhydrous ammonia either in the field or at the silo and essentially make beef cattle and dairy cattle non-competitive with man for both protein and energy. And then one could look on a worldwide basis, the high Andes of South America, and see the llama, the camel of the Andes. These are animals also which graze off the land. One could look at the alpaca, another one, important in terms of feeding and providing food for people on an international basis, or even the guinea pig. There are 60 million guinea pigs produced in Peru alone every year for human food, and they eat everything that people don't eat. They're a part of family enterprises. Then we look at scavenger pigs. These are garbage eaters in many parts of the world, not in this country, as you look at the contrast here. But we can learn much in terms of taking the genetic possibilities with those scavenger pigs and combining what we have here. And then we can look at three great potential areas in food production, which are going to be competitive with us the lowland tropics, which extend all the way from the Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn, the highlands and the Andes, and then we can look at the Sahada, the great savanna areas which have scarcely been touched in terms of agricultural development. Then we look at resources and byproducts in agriculture, the feedlots of America, the manure of which there's millions of tons. In fact, 600 million tons are produced annually. And if there were an economic incentive, we would utilize those wastes more effectively. We could go to the People's Republic of China, by contrast, and see the Great Wall. As we note here and there, see two food systems that have been put together by the Chinese. They're ducks and rice, both very highly prized by the Chinese. The ducks are in there in terms of pest management. They consume both the weeds and the insects and the rice paddies, putting food systems together, a fascinating thing in the Chinese in many ways are way ahead of us in certain areas. We could look at crossbreeding and genetic improvement in terms of the beef cattle of the nation. And one could look at another component in which one could improve genetically, and that's the use of the chemical prostaglandin 2-alpha. You know you can now regulate the reproductive cycle of both horses and dairy cattle and beef cattle and predetermine the time of estrus. This is the first little foal that was dropped as a result of controlled fertility in the case of the mayor. One can look at animal health and put together a package there. This is the vaccine that was developed about five years ago for the control of Merrick's disease in poultry. The first time in history any vaccine has ever been developed that would control cancer. 
The great challenge here now is to put this discovery to use in human medicine, and the opportunities are great. Here we have prenatal immunization, immunizing the unborn against calfhood diseases. It's a reality, folks. It's being done. It's an opportunity for the future in terms of reducing the great losses that occur from calfhood diseases. And then one could look for a moment at the water buffalo of the Far East and Southeast Asia. They're sometimes called water buffalo, they're sometimes called caribou, but they're a draft animal. They're also used for milk purposes, as we can note here, and they're also used for fuel purposes. And 60% of all the fuel that's used in India comes from this type of cow dung cake factory that we see here. You know, in terms of management of resources, folks, we've got a long way to go. And if there were economic incentives to do it, we'd do it. But let's look in terms of international considerations, the great crops we grow, the big three. 85% of all the energy, the calories produced in this nation come from three crops, corn, wheat, and soybeans. This is the number one crop of the nation. We exported 30% this past year, and there's the price pattern for the past five years. Now, you folks know what the problems are, and so do I, in terms of reduced prices at this level. It's much below. This is taken up through October, but it's even lower now. But notice the volatility and the uncertainty of prices with that commodity. Notice wheat, where we exported two-thirds of that which we produced this past year and superimposed upon that commodity the price at the marketplace. And notice what has happened with wheat. Never before has American agriculture experienced this explosive instability and volatility in terms and uncertainty in terms of prices. One could look at soybeans and then superimpose upon that crop of which we exported half of what we produced this past year, the price pattern, and notice again, Soybeans are going up a little bit now, where the wet price of wheat and corn, of course, is depressed. One can look at sugar, tremendously depressed, and notice where it was a few years ago. We've never experienced this kind of a ball game in American agriculture in all of history. It's something new, and notice potatoes and where they are now, they're going up a little bit. There's no industry on earth could encounter those kinds of variations in price and still stay in business. And I think this needs to be recognized by a lot of folks that are not in this room today. And notice in price of steers, we could notice here the volatility that existed with that commodity. Notice where we are now and what the future holds, nobody knows. We've got problems politically and we've got problems internationally in terms of stability of uh, production as well as stability of price. And that will notice the concern of all of us in terms of the scientific area, that production is leveling off. We've not really gained much in the past five or six years. Only by increasing the number of acres have we increased production. And then notice the pattern of agricultural exports. Never before has any nation in all of time, history, exported the massive food product commodities we're exporting today. $22 billion worth this past year and projected for $22 billion this coming year. You know, one, almost a third of what we produce is exported abroad. Then we notice the unique position that the United States and North America holds in the food picture. And this is a message, folks, we need to recognize that 94% of the world's surplus food is in North America. And about 90, about 89% of it's in the United States of America. And notice where it goes. These are the nations which ex import food. It's not the poor countries. It's countries like the Soviet Union. It's East, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, and Japan. That's where our food goes. And of course, it's interesting policy decisions will have to be made in the future. The grain production in the USSR this past year, I met a year ago, 1975, never had there been such a disaster encountered in food production since the days of Khrushchev in the Soviet Union. Yet today, this year, food production, grain production is way back up there again. The Soviet Union cannot consistently feed itself. The Soviet Union has millions of acres of land which are marginally cold and marginally dry. And they do not have the free enterprise system which is conducive in terms of an economic incentive to produce. We look at world grain outlook in terms of the future. Look at what Brazil is doing. Look at the demands of Western Europe. Look at USSR and China. There's lots of uncertainties. I wish we knew the answers for the future. Much of it depends on the weather. And of course, we know that, as we've indicated before. We look at the time for adoption of new technology. It took 36 years for hybrid corn to be adopted in this nation. In Iowa, only seven years. It only took two years for the vaccine for the control of Merrick's disease and poultry to be adopted. We need to speed up somehow the rate of agricultural development on a worldwide basis. And yet it comes back to communications. We've got a land grant system in this nation that relates to agriculture. And here we see it in operation. The highest yields of potatoes, I guess, in all the world are produced in the Columbia Basin out there in Washington. 1,000 bushels per acre, 1,500 bushels per acre, not unusual. We look at technology transfer abroad and see a couple little folks here in South Korea 
they have a livestock program. Apparently, it's a 4-H program because I could see the emblem there. But I want to point out this, folks, and you know it better than I do, that only farmers produce food. And, and farmers will produce food only if there's an economic incentive to produce food. And that has to be recognized here and by anyone who is in this nation <laughs> determining policy. And these guys out on the farm are the ones that have to put it all together and make it work. And I, have, I, 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 I salute and honor you folks here today because you're a part of that package. Well, you know, a lot of things have happened. We've got a whole new administrative organization to re-educate in Washington and many at the state level in terms of what's going on in agriculture. And I want to point out today, this morning, that there was never a greater opportunity for food abundance on this earth than there is today. But the exploitation of that opportunity was never more vulnerable than it is to the uncertain responses of human political institutions. Now, that is not restricted just to the world. That applies to our own state, states and also our own nation. And so I would conclude here this, this morning, folks, as we began, that agriculture, in the end, is farming the sun. And I thank you so much for your kind attention. Great to be with you.